All right, welcome back. Welcome to the shop here in beautiful Canterbury, New Hampshire. It feels like a whole different week, because it is, I guess. But last week, we were in the middle of a class, and I don't know, I'm kind of toasted on Thursday nights when I'm in the middle of class. But I feel refreshed and ready for a Thursday night, Shop Night Live, and I'm glad you're here with me. Tonight, we're going to talk about a chest of drawers and how to make it worth it. Um, but, you know, that I realized I never talked about chests of drawers, so this is an awesome opportunity. I think it's been, it's been over a year, right? And we've not, yeah, we've not hauled one of these babies up here. So we wanted to start small, but now we're getting serious. So hang out with me, and we are going to get into this chest of drawers. But before we do, if you like this content, go ahead and subscribe. And comment, like, ring the bell, all that fun stuff. All right, let's get into it. I have to say, before I start talking about the chest of drawers, last week, when we were in the class, I overheard one of the students say, I have a personal rule, and I think it might have been you, Dean, <laughs> but said, I have a, a personal rule. I never go to the next project until I finish the one I'm working on. And my ears perked up on that. I thought, wow, that's a heck of a rule. <laughs> I was like, well, that's quite the rule. I'm quite impressed. I'm impressed, I'm seriously impressed, because that is not my rule. That's not how I roll, that's not my rule. I do not do that. I have a little problem, as some of you might know. I, I don't know, it's just, um, I'm a dreamer, I guess, and I get to a certain point with projects, and in my mind, they're done, and I'm moving on. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a good thing. Um, now, I could say, but I'm not as bad as that guy. Because I can think of a guy right now who's really bad. And that could console me a little bit. But we're not facing the truth when we do that. So, yes, I'm, hello, my name is Tom. I am a move on to the next project before my project is finished, a holic. Ah, that felt good. Now, if you're in that club, don't be uncomfortable. You're safe here. I, I welcome you with open arms. But this is the beginning of us turning over new leaf and getting things done. Because what I'm going to do on a lot of these Shop Night Lives is I'm going to sprinkle in as we go along. Things that I want to get done. Great projects <laughs> that have been maybe hanging around in different stages that are wonderful learning opportunities. You know, some of them are too complicated to bring out the first year. So here we are. We're in our second year. And you're ready for some solid food now. And so am I. I've got to do this. Now, this chest of drawers is in one of those did not finish categories. You might say, but it looks almost done. You're right, it's almost done. And I even got some finish on it. Now, some of you guys in the New Hampshire Good Guild of Woodworkers, if you're watching now, you might recall this chest because this was the chest that I made during the period of time where I hosted the beginner and intermediate group here at the shop every other month on a Saturday morning. We met for three hours right here. And we built this chest of drawers over, man, what was that? It was, I think it took two years. It was 2011 to 2012. 2012! <laughs> well, you're really ringing it out right here. No, that's when I sprayed. I sprayed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for it. I know. <laughs> I know you're for it, but th it's a problem. And I'm really, I'm sort of embarrassed, but you know what? I know I'm not alone. And you know, there's no shame in this. And we are going to come together. We're going to start getting things done. All right. 
you've got so much good there. Now, if you want to kind of give your admission and be in the circle, you can just comment the name of a project that you just got stirred up and remembered that you have, you know you want to finish it, for some reason you haven't finished it, just go ahead and comment that as we go along. I know you might not be able to do it right away, but... <laughs> They've already chimed in and said they're guilty. Oh, okay. Well, good. All right. Well, anyway, I want, let's get to the project, all right, before we go on that too long. But this, I love this chest of drawers. And there was something about it that bugged me when I was going in the finishing room to finish it. I, and that was sort of my excuse for not doing it. I had planned to surprise the camera lady with this many Christmases and did not get it done. Yes. I'm surprised. Yeah. <laughs> See, it worked. She's surprised. All right, I can put it back in the finishing ring of now. <laughs> put a blanket over it. That's how it's been. All right, so anyway, this chest of drawers has a lot of sentimental value to me um, because the walnut on it was given to me by none other than Pug Moore. There was one day I was in his shop. It was toward the end, like when he was starting to liquidate, get rid of his stuff, you know. A lot of his things, they weren't useful unless you had studied with them, like the patterns. There wasn't enough information on them. So he gave me a lot of those, which I was so grateful for. But one day he said, hey, come here for a minute. And we went up by the finishing room, out where all the bedposts were laid on the wall outside the door. And he said, hey, uh, grab that ladder. And I realized I had never seen this trap door up above the ceiling there in the hallway. And he said, go ahead up there and uh, just push that board up and move it to the side. And there's a light switch there. And so I did. And I'm looking around. And I, it was a small, like, A-frame attic space. It was warm up there. And he used that occasionally, like, to final cure some wood that he logged himself. He might have had it air drying. And then it would just really dry up there in the heat. And, so he said, look over to your right. Do you see a pile of wood? And there, were, there was a stack of four walnut boards. And they were, man, they were like that. And they were probably 10 feet long. I don't know, eight, eight, 10 feet long. But they were just clear. And they were so beautiful. They had the air dried color. They were kind of that purplish that walnut has. And then when you hit it with the finish, it gets this warm, golden, rich, well, like this. I mean, this, this wood right here, this was one of those planks. And I had um, a series, they were, they were log sawn. So this right here is actually a book match where two of the planks match. So you have kind of this, usually I try to hide things like that, but I, I didn't mind it. And then you can see kind of how the grain comes out and comes back here. But it's just a two-board side. And that's the way I love to make the sides of these traditional chests. And then the top. Check this out. This is the top material. So I tried to use some of the best material here. Is that reflecting? or? I'll try to get. How's that? That's good. Look at, that's a two-board top as well. But it's the same thing. It's that beautiful mahogany. Now, this doesn't have the full finish on it. I just sprayed like a thin coat of shellac back then and, uh, and moved on. <laughs> but it's actually got a light, nice little patina. That's one of the advantages of procrastinating <laughs> is that the light hits it. And one of the beautiful effects of walnut is over time, it doesn't darken like other woods like cherry and mahogany, it lightens and it, but it doesn't get like faded. It gets like this rich amber and reds come in a little bit and browns. It's just spectacular. I mean, walnut is probably America's exotic hardwood. It's so beautiful. It's one of the, it's really the, 
I think it's the most beautiful native hardwood. And it works a lot like mahogany. Um, it's a little more, little more fibrous than mahogany. But um, as far as the, the quality of it, I mean, we were always building things in mahogany or walnut, pretty much. That was the main thing. Some things were cherry, every now and then a maple piece. But most antique reproductions, 18th century furniture, were walnut or mahogany, with mahogany being even more prevalent. But uh, walnut was Pug's favorite wood as well. So you can see how I've got the wood on the front here laid out. Um, and th this other side is just as beautiful as the other. And anyway, that has that sentimental value. And then the top of it, I don't know if I can, can you get, can you see that? See that? So the top is made out of heart pine or southern yellow heart. It's more the heart pine. It's got that little different coloration. And this came out of a tobacco warehouse <laughs> in North Carolina. I salvaged some beams. They were tearing one down. So it was the six by six beams. And I got there and look at all the nail holes. But I don't care. It's, it's a three board top. I resawed the beams and got this beautiful traditional um, uh, heart pine for the secondary wood in this case. But this, this chest is actually kind of a hybrid. It's a little bit of the south or mid-south and north because when I came time to building the drawers, instead of using southern pine, I used poplar, which is more common material to use for the secondary wood in the north. So that's what I use there. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the way this thing goes together. I'm not going to get totally into explaining a chest of drawers because we have something in the works. There's probably a chest of drawers project coming in the very near future. We've got a few other projects to do, but um, I'll give you more information as I know. It won't be quite as, well, it will be almost as fancy as this, but this is a Chippendale style chest of drawers. It's got um, beautiful proportions. Pugmore actually would make notes of the things that he liked especially, that he thought, wow, those proportions really feel right about that. And he had this little spiral notebook that he would write and notes and write little sketches. And, and those were some of his favorite pieces that would make it to the notebook. And this dimension of this chest was one. He said, I always like that proportion. It's a two over three because they call it that because you have the top two drawers are divided by a vertical center. So you have two smaller drawers. Now, when this is on the floor, it's at a really nice height. It's about 40 inches high and about 40 inches wide. <coughs> Let me get the tape on it, actually. Um, check it out. 38 is the body, but the top is 40. And the top is 21. 20 and a half inches deep. So it's got a lot of classic Chippendale details to it. Um, this OG bracket feet down here. I know. You want to say, oh, gee, how'd you build that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a kind of a weird name. The OG is the, it's for that Sima curve, that reverse curve. It's the OG style foot. It's a bracket foot instead of just being a straight box type bracket. It's got the, that curve to it. And then a little bead pad there. There's a proud bead all around the drawer. This is all called cock beading. And that's applied after the drawer is made. So you're cutting into the finished drawer to apply this raised bead around the edge. I love that detail uh, on these older chests. Instead of just being a flush fit, you add that nice little bead all around. And then this really nice base molding 
I love that good hardiness. That reminds me of a Newport style chest. Um, and then when I put the top up here, you can see this is different. I, I built this a little differently. A lot of times we would, we would build the chest taller and then wrap this cove molding right here. See that cove right there? We would wrap the chest with that. Or you can build the chest as a box like this, just that height, and then build a frame. See, I have a frame for the molding. Let me take it out. Look at that. <laughs> Another frame that sits on top. So this is a little different style. I like it a little more in some ways because you don't just nail the, the uh, cove to the sides. But it takes a little more time to make, obviously, because you get the frame. But we've got that frame. And then this is a classic uh, Chippendale detailed edge. It's sort of like a thumbnail, but there's this little fillet. It's that little inside corner cut. Can you see that? <laughs> Got to get some of the dust off it. I love this little, this is really nice. You'd see a lot of these chests, like the pug made um, in homes, you know, with this. This is the edge that I would see the most. And I really, really like it. So, all together, you know, I'll put it on the floor some other time, and you can look at it, but um, and see it at the true height. But I thought we'd get it up here, so you could really see it. Now, I want to talk about the drawers, because the drawers are the reason I had said I'm not quite satisfied with this. Now, when you when I built this chest, it's all out of poplar. And everything throughout is solid wood. That's one of the great things about the traditional chess. And when you build a chess of drawers, I've mentioned this a lot to you who've taken the courses, like, like this shaker end table course, where we've got a single drawer, and a lot of people have taken this course, and this was their first experience cutting a dovetail drawer. And it can be frustrating. Um, you know, because you're just getting used to so many things. But if you go beyond that and do some more practicing and then build a chest of drawers, you will have a lot of experience with dovetails. By the end of that chest of drawers, you will probably be able to ride the bike, so to speak, and be able to revisit dovetails and not feel like you're clumsy or forgetting what to do. So one of the reasons that building a chest can really be worth it is to develop your skills for especially cutting dovetails. And the other reason is you can make, make it sentimental. I mean, if you can use a native hardwood or something you really love or something that has a little story to it like this, I mean, I, I don't ever, I'm never going to sell this chest. You know, this is just... Too nice. It has this history of uh, that memory to me. So um, this is a great kind of uh, physical memory. You know, you look at it, and you—it's not only beautiful wood, but it—I remember that that time. Give, give me those boards every time. The other um, thing about making a chest like this worth it is that they're solid. They will last. For a long time, if you build a chest like this, if it doesn't get wet or anything like that, this will be around for, I mean, if it doesn't get wet, it's a couple hundred years. Now, the only drawback with chests like this is that the drawers running in and out, you're running on wood. So we saw a lot of chests of drawers would come into the shop, like old ones, and Billy Frazier would repair them. Um, he was the other help, helper there. And they were run on these runners inside, and it's wood on wood. That's the old way. 
So if you cited it, what you'd often see, and you could do this on some old, if you have some old antiques, and you cite down the edge of this drawer, like where it's running against the wood, and invariably it's going to be curved like this. The wood has worn from coming in and out, and it's usually in that kind of arc. And it starts to drop down a little. Each time, you're just wearing it a little bit. So that was my hesitation finishing this, because I, I wanted to try to avoid having to repair this and make it last longer. And the reason it really got into my mind was I felt how heavy everything was going to be. Let me just grab one of these drawer bottoms. It's not that heavy, but it's just big. You know, this is like a, this drawer bottom is 5 16th of an inch thick, I believe. And it's solid poplar. And it's all hand planed under here. If you have taken the class, you know. Oh, you saw that video of the making the shaker end table, the drawer. That was it. And all hand planed there, too. Look, that's got a nice patina. That must have been <laughs> It's been out in the sun, too. Um, but this green kind of fades a little, gets a little browner over time of the poplar, the heart of the tree. But anyway, that's got some weight. And so I was thinking, man, these drawers are kind of heavy. I haven't even put clothes in them yet. So I decided that I would do the trick that Pug um, used to have Billy do when those worn uh, chests would come in. And that is put a harder strip of wood, laminate it onto the bottom right here. And that's what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to just show you one of them. And it's not that hard to do. I decided I would put a harder wood. And I looked on the, um, the Jenka. You've heard me talk about this. Before. The Jenka hardness. You've heard me talk about this, right? What is the Jenka hardness scale, Miss Camera Lady? me on the spot. Uh, I recall it, it gives you the sequence of hardness, which woods um, rank in certain conditions and categories or something. Golly. You see your face. You are not kind. <laughs> no, you very good. That was okay. a perfect answer. I don't know why you were nervous about I'm that or worried. hesitant. I'm still learning. I'm on this side of the camera, right? No, that's right. <laughs> but Yes, the Jenka hardness scale. It's just, it's just a number um, that it's the number uh, of pounds pressure or newtons, the, the amount of pressure force to embed a 0.44 inch round ball, like a steel ball, I believe, hardened. It was just pressed. Think of that. It's like almost a half an inch, 0.444. And they would, they would just press it into wood. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it got halfway buried, it somehow would trigger um, a, a signal that that's it. And they would measure the force right at that moment. And so it's pretty accurate like, and, and consistent throughout the different uh, hardwoods. And so you have woods like, like white pine are like 500 on the Jenka scale, pretty soft. And uh, poplar is not that much more. It feels harder, but it's, I think it's about six, 600 something. Then cherry is around, um, I think it's around 850. You can look this up on the, on the net. 850 or 900. Walnut's like 950. Um, so, and then, you know, you go right on up. Then your red oak is, I think it's 1,200. And white oak's a little harder. So all these woods, you know, intuitively are harder. There they are. You see how much the difference really is. On the Jenker scale, you'll see them uh, listed there. Some of the exotic hardwoods in, um, like, the um, tropics are unbelievably hard. Um, I have a piece of, um, what the heck's that called? Someone tell me. What's that, that hardest wood? that, oh gosh, I can't think of it right now, my mind. But it's, it's a lot of mallets are made by it. 
and that's that wood is like 4,500 on the Jenga scale. It's almost like rock. You know, um, lignum vitae. Uh, it's a awesome hardwood. It's like almost hitting metal. Anyway, I did want to leave that kind of low Jenka wood on the on the bottom of my drawer side, and that's what happens a lot. Now, on a little table like this. Yeah, white pine's fine. It gets very light use, not a lot of heavy use, and they last a long time. But these are going to get heavier things in them, especially these upper drawers get open and closed more frequently. So we're going to do something. Now, I did think ahead, and my runners are ash or white oak. I think they're ash. And that's pretty high on the Jenka scale. It's... Um, I think it's around 1,400 or something like that, 1,500. So those runners, and those can be replaced. I made them so they will come out. But there's not much you can do here. So we're going to put maple. Maple is about 1,800. Hard maple on the Jacob scale. We're going to put a strip of a quarter inch on the bottom there. Now I know it's going to be whiter. We can touch it up a little bit, but I almost don't care. It's almost like a shoe. Think of it like a a nice hard edge that we're going to apply to this chest. And then I can clean it up and finish it and get it in the house. Okay? So let me show you how we're going to do this. And if you have an old worn out chest that has worn drawer bottoms like that, you can do it too. You can fix that piece. Now I thought about just... Tomorrow. Huh? Next year. Tomorrow. Yeah, next year. I thought about raising the, the cutter on the router table and just running it in. That kind of would work, but there's some little, I'm not that comfortable running it on the bottom of the drawer like that, plus you're losing the drawer bottom. You'd have to clamp something on there, because as you go, you're losing what you're leaning on. So you've got to have a different method. And I, I have this method, it's probably others, but to get it done kind of fast and not go crazy with a jig, this is a great way to do it. I just got a couple pieces of crap uh, pine. This is all feather boarded, a piece of cheap uh, uh, trim board that was painted. You can use whatever. It's about an inch thick. And I cut it, I, I flattened it and uh, edge jointed so we have a nice true edge on both of these boards. And what I'm going to do is attach them to, let's do it this way so you can see. I'll do it on this one. I'm going to just put it in here. And I'm going to clamp this flush with the bottom of my drawer like this. So let's bring it over a little bit. Now this takes a little bit of getting used. I try to... I tried to, I tacked on a scrap piece here, like a piece of wood, so I could just reference and go right up to it, a piece that overhung both sides, but it didn't actually work as well as I thought, so I'm just going back to the manual method, where you take a clamp, and I'm just going to clamp this in position, if I don't drop it. Okay, so I'm just going to lightly clamp it. While I get it set, I need the square. And we can come across here. Get it on a little more. Just want to check that we're parallel across. Let me get one on down there further. I wish you could see this better because it's kind of a close in shot. It's hard to see this, but. I'm just getting both these boards in plane with the middle. And I want it, they're square already, but having, using the square like this helps me to see that that looks good right down there. Let's bring it up. Actually, it looks pretty good all the way. Maybe this one can go up a little bit. So I'll take a little hammer and just tap it. Loosen a touch. And let's see how that is. That looks good. 
Okay, so I can put on another clamp in the middle just so it doesn't move. And there we are. Now, I'll put this down. And now I have these two straight parallel ways on each side of my drawer bottom edge. And I can route down the middle here with a, uh, a flat bottom cutter. I'm going to route a depth of about a quarter of an inch. So let me get... put a clamp over here if you had to do it again I'm asking this not anybody else okay if you had to do it again would you have constructed it with that yes uh, I probably would have and that would be much easier than doing this <laughs> <laughs> because you're thinking about it and what I would do is I'd laminate the edges um, I would probably glue a wider strip between two drawer sides and then rip it down the middle so I'm left with a piece on each side. And then you could thickness it, uh, get it down to your drawer thickness, side thickness, which I always use half inch pretty much, sometimes thinner, depends how large the piece is. But um, you can, uh, yeah, you can have that on there. So the chest that I build in the future. I think that's what I'm going to do. You know, ideally, a wood that's light and has very little seasonal movement is perfect for a drawer side. That's why, for fun, we did that on this table, and we use quarter sawn wood for the drawer sides. So this is white pine, the least amount of seasonal movement. But the only drawback is drawback. The only drawback is that it's soft and it will wear faster. So I think the ideal drawer side would be, you know, you laminate a piece of hard maple or something like that on the bottom edge, but the rest is quarter sawn white pine. That would make an incredibly stable, but light, but long wearing drawer. So anyway, let's get back. Brian's asking, could you use teak, something like teak that's oily and very hard? <laughs> that's a good question. Sure, I think you could. Um, the one thing you have about teak is gluing it down. There's always this warning because the oils do affect the glue bond. They can. So it's always a little, but you can glue it. You want to wipe it with acetone right before you glue it up. Acetone like takes away all the oil from the surface. Just long enough before it starts to seep back. Um, but yeah, that would work. But you know, the way I do my drawer bottom uh, finishes is, um, is shellac and wax. And it runs really great. Now, of course, after a while, where it's rubbing, you'll rub away the shellac. And then you're really relying on the hardness and the smoothness of the wood. I don't know if this is true, but I was told a long time ago that it's good to have an open grain wood bearing against a closed grain wood, that they slide better on each other. That's why I put ash, an open grain hardwood, as my runners, and I've, I'm going to be using a closed grain a, a hardwood like maple for the drawer side. So even without any kind of wax or anything, it'll still slide well. But the wax will stay in there. And But shellac and wax is the best I think, way to get that running. It just will float once you get it nicely fitted. All right, so what I did was I ran some strips of, of the hard maple. I just had a chunk. And I sawed it up and ran them a little bit wider than my drawer sides are and they're about a quarter of an inch thick. I squared up one end. I made a little line on that squared up end. And it, they're a little over long, so I'll just trim them to fit. And I want to be butting it up to the front here. Now this is where my bead is on the front. My drawer front is right here. So I'm going to route, and I have to stay 
short of this. I don't want to go into that. I'd rather chisel it than try to get cute and route right up to it. Especially since the router bit that I'm using on this nice little delta, oops, on this nice little delta router is a, um, let me see if I can do this. Can you see that? I'm sorry, DeWalt. Um, it's a, it's actually a dovetail bit. It has a very slight angle on it. I think it's about a seven. Uh, no, it's a, it's a one ten or something like that. So not my, a very shallow slope. But I like using that slope for this type of cutting because it leaves. I feel like it leaves me a cleaner exit cut instead of a straight. Just using a straight cutter in a case like this. This will give me a nice exit cut, and then these ways will act as backer so I don't tear out the, uh, where I make the finished cut on the bottom. I'll end, I'll end up with a nice clean cut. But I'm going to make this cut in two passes. The first one will be half of the thickness, so let's say about an eighth of an inch. So what I'm going to do is take a piece of eighth inch plywood and just put it into the depth stop. I have the depth is already set. I got it. <laughs> How am I going to do this? Okay, here we go. Need a hand? No, I usually do it on the table, but I'm trying to show you here. So here's it's hitting the depth stop and now I just loosen. There we go. And I'll take that out. So I'm going to go about an eighth of an inch and then I'll make a second pass at the full quarter of an inch. All right, I'm going to turn on this dust collector. This thing is going to be drawing a lot of air, and it'll keep a lot of the dust down if I can find my collector. Ah. What did I do with it? <coughs> I'm going to go this way. Um, Sorry. Oh, here it is. All right. I got to open that door so we get return air. Okay. Turn on the air. Put my hearing protection on. Eyes. Here we go.
right. Chris is asking how you keep that on a straight line. You said something? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, I heard. What did you say? Uh, Chris is asking how you kept the router, uh, guide the w router. Into oh, it's the just incredible line. skill, Chris. <laughs> No, actually, it's not that hard. I just, no, it actually uh, isn't that hard. It just kind of, it's not a lot of force. See, if you tried to take a big bite, yeah, you probably would have been fighting it more, but I was skimming a lighter pass. So lighter passes, more control with the router. So I was able to keep it right in there. And then I've got a nice clean edge. Can you get in? You can see how flush the bottom that drawer bottom is with the the edge guide so I don't mind cutting into the guide that's why I made them wider and I have them as pine and they act as a nice backer so that edge is very clean so when we glue the new piece on it'll be seamless so let's get this off and this is what we would do we just go and get in a groove and or maybe not a groove but a routine and route all those out and uh, get them to this but I'll just do one for now and then you still have this little bit at the end here so I meant to go a little further than I did but it's not a problem what I'm going to do is take a chisel and holding it flat on here I'm going to let well, I didn't mean that to happen. <laughs> I meant to make a side cut first. Um, and then I'm going to go this way. Is that a bad thing? No, it, did, it would have been bad if it... I mean bad in the lightest sense of the word. <laughs> it would have been bad if the grain drove down, you know, and then I would have had a little gap there to fill, but the grain's pretty straight, so it just went right with the grain. But now I'm using the, the side just to clean that up. And that's nice and clean. Let me get it. I got to have to move in front of you. And I want to make sure there's no glue on this face. So that's a nice inside corner. Now I'll get one of my strips out. Pick one of the... They're all good, but some are better than others. And I've got my little squared end marked here. So that's going to butt into this end here. Let's see, do I like that piece better? I even saw this so it's quarter sawn. Not that it would matter a whole lot, but what's bearing, I think it is a little bit harder in the quarter sawn because you have the edges, all the edges of the harder growth rings. But with, with maple, I don't think it matters. Um, All right, that feels good right there. So I'm going to get my glue. Where's my glue? Ah, here it is. And you don't need a lot of glue to do this. I'm just going to put, I did get a tiny, maybe that was already there. I'm going to put a little glue right here. And I'll make two beads up here. I'm going to go kind of thin because... It'll squeeze out. It'll, I don't want too much extra, but I want to make sure I got enough on there. So those are two like skinny beads. Brandon's asking, what are the light dots on the side of the drawer face? Oh, those are um, those are from using filler that was kind of light, and uh, I think it might have. It wasn't quite walnut, but I just used a filler because I tacked these little brad points in there. I think I might have used a nailer. If I did it now, I would use my pin nailer um, and get them even less obvious. And then you'd fill, it'd be less. But that'll be colored with a tiny, like a brown uh, touch-up marker, and those will melt right away. So here we uh, go. Good eye, Brandon. My goodness. Yeah. Um, I thought someone was going to say that. <laughs> no, that's all right, Brandon. <laughs> I noticed that too. All right, so I've got that on there. Now I'm going to just kind of smear it in there get full coverage 
get a nice little like rub fit here and that is really bonded so I'm getting squeezed out down both sides I want to get a rag and get a lot of that off you're gonna laugh Dan I got them at Dollar General who has we were kind of in a, a hurry and there's one really close here so I took a chance they might have them those little bottles those are great little bottles they're in the uh, believe it or not they're in the cake decorating section I took a, a chance so oh, that's what they are. They're probably to frosting. put the icing or whatever, and write your name. Yeah. yeah, so they have the kind of a small hole. You can control Very it Very affordable. a little I better. It, I think four for $5 or something. Okay, so I got that on there. Now, instead of putting in a big complex clamp, no need. We've got, we're going to tape this on because we've got this automotive tape that's stretchy and strong. Now, I might cut it a little bit here and there, but it takes a lot to do that with this automotive tape. So I'm getting it in position. I'm a little overhanging on the inside and a little on the outside, just barely, and push, pull it forward. And now I'm gonna take the tape, go across, and stretch it. You know what, I'm gonna put a clamp on this. I don't like it sliding around. Did you just say something? I'm sorry, that instruction to me. What? Me? I missed what you heard, and I thought maybe you were telling me to. No, I didn't say anything. Yeah. No. Sorry. <laughs> I was just putting a clamp on it. All right, so I'm just going to pull, stretch, and pull down, and that's it. Now I'll do this every, every inch and a half or two. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. They are um, they're in the cake decorating area. They're used for icing. I know. Dollar General has a cake decorating section. Sounds weird, but that's where I found them. By the way, you guys, we have some friends who are in the cake decorating world. Do you want to tell them about that? Uh, there's a number on it, Stuart, because it's for classes for the students, and so we just wanted to be able to have sort of everybody knows which bottle is theirs kind of thing. <clears throat> um, Not sure why we did it. Yeah, that was. Oh, that was that was because we were virus concerned. We didn't oh, want people yeah, I touching. Oh yeah, that was what it was too. Your other bottle. Everybody had their own glue bottle. <laughs> it wasn't so so we could get somebody in trouble if they mishandled it or anything like that. But Although I I was noticing. Um, what was your? Did some you ask me a question? I said we have some friends oh, that are yeah. in the cake decorating world. The McGreevies. Unbelievable cakes that they make. They're based in Rochester, New York area. You can uh, check Shana, them out online at uh, Sean and Thomas McGreevy. Cake Heads. They have a membership group called Cake Heads, but you can find them online also at McGreevy Cakes. You can follow them on Instagram. McGreevy crazy cakes, stuff. Really I mean, way better than Cake skills. Boss. I mean, Cake Boss was good, but stuff insane. Like, Cake boss. Oh. Great people. See, that's what will happen when you go a little crazy. But it takes a lot of force to do that. So this is stretching, pulling, and then getting it on there. And I even tried putting clamps to see if I get any additional squeeze with this method, and I didn't. So I'm quite satisfied that's a good method. Now, I left a little overhang so I can trim that at the end. And that's all you have to do to just... Go, go to town, tape them on there. So I got a nice little glue bead, a really nice glue joint, and I'll just scrape the glue off and clean it up after. Now I got one already done. So I'm gonna take that out of the oven and show you that. That's why that drawer was missing. I know you were wondering. So this one was done earlier, and you can just take the tape off. And it really only has to sit on there an hour, so um, you can work it even less than that, but I'd, li I'd like to let it go that long. And then you're going to have to clean it up and refit or fit the drawer, make sure it's fitting well. That's one thing, you know. Um, this is a great time of year, actually, to fit drawers <laughs> on a chest because... 
because it's the humid time of year and you're getting the expansion of the drawer sides see the drawer the wood is expanding and contracting this way not on the length it doesn't hardly at all this way so in the space it's expanding and contracting and if a drawer sticks usually it's because the drawer sides have swollen up and they're jamming in there but in the summer months they're really at that peak because of the humidity so if you fit it and it slides nicely right now you know it's going to be shrinking a little bit in the winter and you won't have to worry about it binding any time of the year all right so let's get this on Tom, uh, Steve's asking, will you use a hand plane to trim the edges? Yes, Steve. I'm going to show you right now. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I like to, actually, this is so small, a little overlap, right, that I'm going to use a, uh, that nice Lee Nielsen uh, low angle. It's awesome for tuning up the bottom edges like this. So the first thing I like to do is just get a little of the excess glue off with a card scraper. So that comes off pretty easily. Now I'm getting into the maple. I'll do the same over here. Just that little bit of glue that gets squeezed out. There we go. The inside, same. I think I'm just I'll just card scrape the inside. I don't, that's so close. And I don't mind having the drawer runner a little wider on the inside if I need it. You know, it gives you a little more bearing surface there. But it's pretty near flush anyway. Okay, so once I've got that, now I'm going to come down to the end of the bench. Get rid of this stuff. And I'll make a, this is the method... If you saw our shaker and table with a drawer, you saw this method. Because what I do is take a board and clamp it into my bench dogs down at the end, like this, with it overhanging. So you want the space in here to be about the, the width of your drawer on the interior along the side there. And then I'll just throw a clamp on here. Now I have this cantilevered support. I can bring the drawer and lap it right over and just plane right here nicely. No problem. So we'll take our, our plane and just go right down. And you can see what we have proud right there. And I'll just go until I start seeing I'm taking poplar, which I just did right there barely. But up here, I still have, I still have glue right there. So I'll, I'll lift up where I think where I've already gotten. So that looks pretty flush. Now you can see I'm getting poplar next to the. It's so thin that it's fine to take a little poplar too, and that's beautiful. I mean, that's nice and flush. So that's good. This is a good time to saw that off. I'm just going to take the Japanese saw here. Just go easy at the end there so you don't uh, tear it out. And you can clean that up a little bit. All right, so I'm going to get the other side, same thing. Just flip it. I can go around this way so I can do it so you can see. And here we go. Love those little curls. These planes are so nice when they're tuned up like this. You, can you have such control if you shut your mouth and just leave the blade slightly on. <laughs> That's the, the secret is you've got to shut your mouth. All right. Um, and then we're going to cut that off at the bottom. So 
flip around. Get this guy. Nice and flush. And let's clean that up. That's good. All right, so now I'd go ahead and clean up all my drawers like that. You know, you're doing all this systematically. I'd do them all and get them all cleaned up. Now I want to fit it back into the case. So I'm looking at it and I'm, what I like to do is what's called ski tipping your drawer back. So it, you want the, the runner to rise up as you push it in. You don't want that edge dragging. So you want to ski tip it. Um, the grain looks like it might be running the wrong way, but I'll go light and see. So that's good. So that's rolling this side, hopefully. That's nice. See how you're just going over the edge. So now it's, that's all you got to do. Now, it's pretty clean. I've got a little glue residue there. I'm not going to run the plane on the bottom until I test the fit. If I need to, I will, but it feels absolutely flush where the previous one was because I was careful to, uh, you know, dimension and set the depth of the router exactly the same as the thickness. So we ended up with the same. So let's test it. So we come on over here. That new and improved drawer runner. Set it in there. Oh, yeah. Runs great. Nice and smooth. And we've got now this hard maple running on oak. Now, if you need to tweak it, you can refer back to that, fitting that drawer on that shaker table. It was kind of a series of cuts where I had to clean up around. I've already done fitting on these, so they fit pretty nice. Um, and the last thing after I'm done fitting them all up is once I get all the finish on, I'm going to put on the hardware. And the hardware is the classic Pugmore thing too. A little oversized, um, but I've had this box of hardware for a long time. <laughs> so these are, these are classic. Uh, swan bale poles. You can see why they call them swan. Right? And these are heavier than I usually do. I just thought, I want to have a good, hearty, uh, brass swan bale pole on this. And these I got at Horton Brasses. They're a great company for, for brasses in general. Um, a lot of, we would get a lot of our hardware when I was with Pug from there for um, period furniture. You had all the Chippendale and uh, Heppelwhite, Queen Anne uh, brasses that you would need. And then there are also the bed hardware that I'll be talking about when we start our bed project uh, a little later in August 25th. August, yeah. After we have a little vacation, right? You should have some too. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> and anyway, the cool thing about this is you have these little escutcheons, these little round plates. And, and you've got the, gosh, I can't even, it's been so long since I used the pin. Um, it's not the pin. Oh, I'm sorry. So, okay, ready? <laughs> Nothing, no, you're fine. And then I just, I have, they're all spaced. You get them sized. I think this is maybe a four inch one. Usually I'm using like three and a half or three and three quarters. But this chest can handle it. And look at that. Get that nice hardy bale yeah, pull. I mean, that's beautiful. a beast. And then, so you just drill the holes and the post 
goes in there, and that's everything's nice and brass about this. And the color looks really good with walnut because walnut has the brown tones. And when we get the full finish on here, the warm colors of the brass look awesome. And this is the way we would always get the brasses at, um, at Horton. Man, look at that. That's a hearty. <laughs> That's a nice bowl. And so these go down this way, and then this post is centered. Usually we would center that approximately with the center here. So it would be indexed and referenced out. Of course, this one's centered. And then the, because of the shape of the bale, you never put the post right in the middle height of the drawer. If you put the post right there, it looks like it's slung too low. So when you're drilling the holes, you go up a quarter to sometimes 3 eighths of an inch above the center line. But of course, they're centered side to side. But see how that's up a little higher than the midpoint? Like here's my midpoint. But then when you step back and you look at the bale pull, the, the weight, a mass of it feels right. And the same is true with these. These are all about a quarter of an inch higher than the center line of the drawer to get them to look right. That was a little, little thing that we did down at the old Pugmore station. Are you going to wax the runners, Ken's asking? Yes. The interior will be shellacked with two coats, two thin coats of shellac, everything on the inside. And then... It'll be lightly sanded. And even then, the powdery, silky, smooth feeling it'll have. And then I will put wax on the runners in here, on the sides, and also on the bottom of the drawer on the sides. And I'm telling you, it's a thing of beauty. It's fun to work a nice wood-on-wood -wood drawer. I can't pull this because I don't have the nut Is that something there. you'd replenish? I don't know if you've ever... Um, Never seen you replenish it, but I've never known. We've never needed to. Like, we don't really have big. We don't have any chests in the house, do we? We don't even have any chests that I've made in the house. But we will right here because we are in group therapy, and I am going to lead the discussion. But we're all together in this. No one's above anyone else. So. Um, yeah, I'm going to just try to keep plugging away and getting some of these projects done so you can come along and maybe it'll be inspiring to get your pieces done as well. I'd be curious to hear what projects you have ready yeah, to go. Yeah, there was a list of the those pipeline. that um, courageously admitted. Well, good. Their project of, of choice. Are there any eight years old? <laughs> we didn't ask for time. <laughs> no, we, no, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't um, matter. It just, okay, I've uh, got a couple more questions. Okay. I, I think I heard you talk about the finish uh, process on the interior. What will you be doing on the outside? Almost the same. Joe's asking. Joe. Uh, I'm sorry, Ken asked that. Ken. Uh, walnut, we, a lot of the furniture, we, we would use shellac on the exterior, too. Uh, a little amber, the orange shellac is great, but you don't want to overdo it. Um, the amber tint warms up the walnut. Now, the walnut, you think of it as a warm wood, but it, when it's air dried, it's really the maximum beauty of the color. Um, you can use steam dried. You'll still get a nice looking walnut, but something about the seaming process, to me, it grays it out a little bit and kind of deadens it. But when you have real air dried, rich colored walnut like this chest, all you need is shellac. And amber shellac, that amber is a warming kind of color. And so the purplish cold values in the walnut initially will be warmed and mellowed. So it's a wonderful treatment on walnut. You don't want to go crazy. Just a couple coats of that, like thin. I usually spray it. And I'm spraying it a pound and a half cut initially. Um, at least a couple amber coats to start. I'll put another one on here. This doesn't have the full mm, quite yet, um, but it has, it has matured and mellowed. It's got the patina going here. So anyway, then you can leave it at shellac, build it up, we go to clear once you get the, 
the value of the amber you want and you can go clear and then it gets all rubbed out with steel wool and wax. The top, however, you want something more durable on that because you may, you're probably going to have glasses of liquid will be put on top and you'll get water rings and the shellac doesn't hold up quite as well as something more durable. So I'll always put a top coat of, um, you can just spray in the can, you can get some lacquer in a can, get good ventilation, you do it outside. We used to actually spray this um, finish called De Deft, you probably have seen it, it's a brushing lacquer but it's also sold in the can. And if you get like a, I think it was satin deft, it looks beautiful. And it's, you can spray shellac, uh, lacquer in a can. And you just, we would just do the top, a couple coats, and then you can rub it out and it looks wonderful. But you can also do your last coat with um, wax-free shellac and you could apply um, anything you want. You could apply a varnish, it will adhere to the wax-free shellac. So you could put tongue oil, whatever. You want something more durable though, that last coat on the top. So that's how we would handle it. Do you router sink the um, pole? Sorry, let me get this question correct. Um, do you router sink the nuts be inside the drawers? Yeah, the very good question. Yeah, I do. I don't router them. I, um, that's Joe's question. Joe, I, when I drill them, I go, I take a Forstner bit and I hit it with a Forstner about an eighth inch deep and I'll cut these posts. This is brass so it cuts easily and, but I'll get the nut on there so I'll cut them so that everything will be flush. There won't be any sticking out to catch clothes on or anything like that. Because we couldn't have the camera lady snag anything on there. <laughs> One other Huge thing concern. is interesting to note. And now look, I'm going to go into detail when we build our actual chest. Um, a lot of this stuff, the finish and all that, we'll cover. So stay tuned. Um, that's another good reason to be subscribed. You'll know when it's happening. But these stops, you notice they're in the front. On a chest of drawers, a traditional chest of drawers like this, the stops, the drawer stops, which index so the drawer lands to the stopping point at exactly the time that the face is flush. So you have that nice proud bead all around. That, the stops are in front because the cross grain construction here with the chest. See the sides are long grain here and the, the door sides and the side of the chest, the grain's running the other way. So this chest is contracting and expanding seasonally. Not a lot, maybe not even an eighth of an inch, right, over that length. But if we made our stops in the back, it would be fluctuating whatever amount this is moving seasonally. It would be out and back, you know. But when you put the stop right in the front, there's really no room. So you're always referencing and not moving. When we built our little shaker end table, we didn't have to worry about that because the grain on our sides of our end table are running long, aligned with our side, so there's virtually no movement there, so we were able to put our stops in the back. All right, that's uh, all. Somebody asked if you were uh, going to French polish the top, but you answered what you're going to do, so. No, I'm not going to go quite that wild. No, I'm, I'm going to put a uh, more durable finish. I mean, French polish can be fairly durable but not to the durability of even a lacquer or a, um, a varnish. Uh, Dan is asking if you would make plans for this chest of drawers. Yes, Dan, I'm planning to uh, make plans for the next 10 years, Lord willing. <laughs> so I am, I've got a lot of plans in my head but um, the first plan will be the chest that we make on the next video, which is not going to be a Chippendale chest, but uh, eventually I will get around to the Chippendale. And along those lines, uh, Stuart's wondering if we could have the materials list ready before you start the bed project on, in August. 
Um, so you might want to talk about your plan for the plants. On okay. That. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's not hard. We'll get we'll get that out. Um, we are. I am actually will be drawing that bed next week and portion. So hopefully I don't procrastinate or get distracted and nope. I get that done. Looks good. We're going to have the plans ahead on that one, I hope. Yeah, so. That's not super complex, um, complicated, but, um, you know, the posts are similar, but it is, that's a nice, that's going to be a nice project. A good, honest mortise and tenon with the good traditional bed bolts connecting it together. Um, Florentino is asking, why would, would, why woodworkers and wood shops are going out of business? Can someone survive from woodworking? <laughs> oh. That's a good question. What was his name? Florentino. 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 That's an excellent question. Um, boy, it's hard. I know. Look, I, everybody says, I wouldn't wish my career on anyone. You know, some people say that. I really love it. I love what I do. But it is hard. It's not easy to do anything kind of in the arts, you know, um, you, especially you start making custom one-of-a-kind pieces that are your imagination. You have to be a good in the business side as well. And that's probably not what draws you into that career in the first place. So having the skill set is rare for the person to excel in that way and be able to market their furniture and also make, make good furniture. So... I don't know, a lot of people end up, you know, making the same thing over and over, and you can do it that way, but if you're, if you're easily bored like me, um, or I got caught up in the furniture masters of being original and trying to <laughs> do it, it's, you end up making more one-of-a-kind pieces, and you have to charge a lot more money for them, so you've got to find good clients, who are willing to. So yes, it's challenging, but um, if you're starting out, I would advise to get with other people who you respect, who you see are doing it right, and learn as much as you can from people who are successful in the many levels that there are to be successful in any business, in the art and the business side. But one of the reasons I just love to teach, but this is a good, for me, this is the right time in my life to be passing it on, but I love doing it too. So, um, so teaching is a viable complement to making custom furniture. There's a lot of ways to do it. Probably but, yeah. also because so many people can get furniture pretty cheaply now. Yeah, if they're comparing it to imported furniture, if you're buying yeah. that grade, yes. It's hard to compete with imported stuff. So many so businesses. Martin's noticing a hole in the middle. He says, how do you attach... Uh, a nail hole in the middle? A nail hole in the middle of what? Uh, I'm not sure. It just says it looks like a nail hole in the middle. How, how do you attach the molding on the bottom of the top on the side? How do you attach the molding on the bottom and the top on the side? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> to be a little more specific. It sounds like John Jacobs' Jingleheimer Schmidt song. How do you attach the molding on the bottom of the top of, on the side? <laughs> Moving at the bottom, there. all right, at the bottom of the top on the side. Oh, maybe that. Okay. Wow. That's, well, first I attach the top to the molded edge, and I let it move back here. I'll slot a screw that goes up in here so it'll be fixed in the front, and I'll put under the frame a slotted screw. So the top will be affixed to this base, and then... This will get set on, and I'll actually run screws up through, that'll be countersunk in here, and that'll hold, go into the frame of the cove molding. That'll hold that down in the front. I mean, you could, you can actually glue it in the front and partially down the side, and then put a screw in the back too, which I might end up doing, but I'm not sure. I think I might... I might just put screws in there, let it stay. Do you recess the interior of the pole? Recess the interior of the pole. Jerry's asking, do you recess the interior of the pole? 
The interior. Is, are we talking about the inside again? Is that maybe what you had? Yeah, I think we already before? showed that. Yeah. yeah. This, I, I make recesses for the nut in there. You can see it better at that light. So the nut will go in and it'll set into that shallow recess. It's a Forstner bit, eighth inch thick. And then the, the bolt will be cut off flush and filed. It'll be all good. All right. Mar um, Martin clarified, I think, and I missed this earlier. He was asking about how to attach the top like that. He said since the grain of the molding versus the top is not in the same direction. Yeah. Did you answer that? Okay. Yes, by slotting it in the back and letting it move. Okay, let me see. Any more questions? Okay, I think we're good. All right. Wow. This has been fun. I've I've enjoyed digging this out, coming clean about my addiction of moving on, and starting on a new path of finishing things. And this, I will, I'll show you when we get it done. We'll show you the finished product. Um, I would kind of show you finishing it. It'd be a fun one to show spraying, but we're going to do that along the way on other things more comprehensively on a whole project. So I will show you this when we get it done. I've got the back, back here. And this is kind of fun. We'll, we'll do this on our other project. This is a frame and panel back. Pretty nice, huh? Just hand plane the whole thing. I just hand planed it. Look at that. It's already got that mellow age. Actually, I sprayed a little shellac on that. And I put this on the outside, believe it or not. I put the raised panel on the inside. And that is the exterior. So it is a nice fix back. All right. Wow. That was fun. We will, this is kind of a tease for the, the full course that we'll be doing in the near future on building a chest of drawers. Be a great introduction. Um, we will be starting our bed class on the 25th, and we'll be back in the groove of meeting three times a week, if you can stand it. And uh, <laughs> I can't wait. I enjoy it more yeah. than um, just once a week. So thank you so much for joining me here, for hanging out in the shop with the camera lady and me. I love sharing this, my life with you in creative world of wood and I hope you'll come back next time right back here on Thursday night on Shop Night Live! <laughs> See you then. Good night friends. <laughs> <laughs>